Defense Matters, a podcast about defense, technology, and the power of that movement. An Israel Defense production in association with IAI. Hello, welcome to Defense Matters, a podcast about all matters of defense and why they matter. I'm your host, Darren Heller, and I hope you're enjoying our journey into the world of security, military affairs, technology, and everything in between. Each episode, we take a look at a relevant aspect in the world of uh, technology and, and security, especially focused here in the Middle East, and we analyze it with a featured guest. We also take a look into the future in our Game Changer Corner, in which we look at the technologies that will shape tomorrow's battlefield. Before we get started, just a quick note that we're a new podcast, and you can find us uh, wherever you get your podcast on YouTube, on Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So please click that subscribe button and follow us uh, to get us going. Now, let's dive into episode four. Today, we're going to focus on a critical element of modern warfare, and that is the war over perception, the war over image. It's a sore spot here in Israel because there's an image or a perception here, at least in Israel, that the country handles itself well on the battlefield whenever there's a conflict. When it comes to explaining itself or portraying itself in the world, uh, that's where it struggles more. And of course, this is front and center recently with the uh, shooting death of Al Jazeera reporter Shirina Abu It's turned into a PR nightmare for Israel, uh, where essentially it's too early for us really to even say who shot the, the bullet that killed the reporter. But it seems like it doesn't even matter because in the court of uh, public opinion, the verdict has already been delivered and Israel has been found guilty. So the question is... It was this inevitable? Was there anything Israel could have done differently? And for that, and to discuss this and a lot more, I'm really pleased to be joined today by retired Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, who's a former international spokesperson of the IDF. Today, he is the Director General of International Relations Division at the Hastedwood Labor Union. Peter, thank you for joining. Great That's to be here. Thank you. So let's just jump right into that with the last thing that I mentioned there. Okay, we don't really know exactly what happened yet. There's still a lot of investigations. But does it even matter? I mean, is it, has Israel already been found guilty? Is there anything it can do to overcome this perception? So in communications and in combat, there are two timelines. One is the immediate uh, needs of what is actually happening, that the reporters are always going to report on, uh, the reality on the ground, how are things developing, and the operational timeline, the military tri- timeline, which is an extended timeline. You have the operational incidents that take place, then if there's a mishap or a, a uh, tragedy during the exchange, then the military will always go back and have its lessons learned and try and see what went wrong and investigate and, and, and so on. So I would say the problem isn't the fact that we don't know what happened, is that the, these two timelines in this day and age can't converge. You have the rapid news that is you know, upbeat and social media uh, incentivized, uh, that spills over into traditional media, the narrative is set before any of the questions are answered. And it doesn't matter whether it's a tragedy or a professional success. Mm-hmm. The narrative will always be set but in those, I would say, in the golden hour that happens in the immediate uh, aftermath. So given those limitations the Army has, they want to be thorough, they want to go through their investigation. How do you close that gap? Because when this thing happened, I was taken back in time to, I'm sure you remember the Muhammad the Dur case. It's not the first time. Here. And when I look back at that, I'm even trying to, i got to be honest with you, I don't even remember (laughs) who eventually was found in the investigation because it didn't really matter. The Palestinians established early on, Israel did it, it didn't really matter what the investigation showed afterwards. So communicating crisis is is an art. And there are things that you have to be able to do. And there are things that you have to be able to say even if you don't have an answer, uh, a concrete answer. So from from the position of the military or the Israeli establishment, because what we saw here, which was actually quite extraordinary, is that the entire Israeli establishment worked in sync, in like a an orchestra. And uh, what we did see is that people were saying, hey, we don't know if this is a situation uh, that is actually being claimed by the Palestinians. We can't confirm that. And I think in the first, you know, in the first two days of this crisis, um, the institutions actually had a solid message base. They were, it was covered by almost all of the media that this is what Israel is saying. And they were reflecting both sides in the argument that was re- developing in, in this situation. That, of course, in the aftermath of the funeral, which is a, an operational failure, um, took took off into a completely different direction. But the, the, the operational incident, the, the, the actual shooting that killed 
um, the journalist, uh, from a media perspective, you know, these crises in the battlefield, they will always happen. And it can be a child, it can be a journalist, it can be medical team. The, the, the dynamics of the battlefield will always result, and has, since the dawn of warfare, has always resulted in civilian casualties. And, and a professional military is operating in order to limit and mitigate and, and, and limit the civilian impact and, and the footprint that is brought on by the, by the conflict. Um, but ultimately, it will sometimes fail, and the communications apparatus needs to be able to mobilize in order to reflect the complexity, complexities of the battleground. Now, now, you mentioned about the military, that gap between the operational and the, and the communications side. Obviously, the military has their timeline. The IDF spokesman who used to work is sort of caught in the middle, because they're the ones who's going to try to um, communicate that. So, is it just that, that maybe the IDF, the way it's built, any military, is just too slow to handle this kind of news cycle? It's working sort of like, you know manually in a digital world? I mean, how do you close that gap? You've got to do it immediately and have answers immediately. So this question has probably been the sticking point since, I would say, the first Gulf War. CNN broadcasting live, images from the battlefield. How do you, how do you check? How do you fact check what is actually happening? And can you control the media battle space? And I'd say today you can't. You need to be relevant. You need to be convey what you know. You need to be forthcoming. And when you look at those situations, I would actually say in this crisis, they actually did do that. Um, uh, I was watching from the outside and I was seeing that there was a good synchronization in all of, this, all of the apparatus. I would say that they could have probably been better being more on camera or more elaborate on social media or, 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 or having more information about what was happening as it was developing. Um, I would say more talking heads in that, in that respect. But I think that the, the fundamentals were there. So uh, my criticism actually about the managing of the communications effort here is actually on the fringe and not in the essence. The essence, because these realities, as long as we have no political horizon, and the military operations are taking place in, civ in the civilian arena, and there's always going to be some sort of conflict or, 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 or negative development, that you need to be able to mobilize quickly, have something to say, um, uh, fact-base it, but you also need to, I would say, uphold and cultivate that relationship um, in, in real time, but also when nothing is happening. So there's certain things, obviously, that you see, that's the nature of the beast. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, there's a gap, there's an existing thing. But there are some things which are self-inflicted damage. And you mentioned one of those now with that funeral procession. How do you explain that? I mean, I'm sure that there's there are going to be people who are going to believe in Israel's guilt no matter what. But did Israel just have a really, as you mentioned, operational failure here by just beating up those people at the at the funeral? That's just self-inflicted damage, isn't it? There's nothing. No. I, there can, that incident cannot be spun any way to make it look good. I mean, it was clear from, I was watching it as it was developing on social media and I was like in shock. And I don't envy um, anybody who had to try and um, acknowledge or, or justify how the professional troops operated the, the police force. Um, of course, it doesn't help that the police don't have a, an international spokesperson to communicate what is actually happening. I think there's also a need to, to, to conduct a preemptive activity. You can't just wait until the event happens and then say, this is what happened. You need to say, this is what we're planning. This is how we intend to do it. The media are invited. This is, you need to manage it. And I'm not certain that that was actually the situ situation in this. It seemed like it just rolled out of uh, control into this huge um, uh, snowball mm -hmm. and had this completely terrible neg negative effect. You mentioned before the issue about uh, the gap between or the, the limits of what you can do in explaining things. And I think that touches on an issue here in Israel that people tend to always try to blame Hasbara, so to speak, is a Hebrew word for explaining yourself. And at some places, there are just things that are very hard to explain. It doesn't become a matter of communication. It becomes a matter of policy. And when it comes to the occupation of the West Bank, Israel finds itself dancing around it a lot. And a lot of people criticizing its spokespeople for not being eloquent enough when at the core there's a policy issue that's very hard to defend. So I'd say it also reflects on how we're communicating and how we've been communicating. I think um, before we went through a period with when Trump was president where it didn't matter 
what you said, as long as you drill down into your own core audience. I think that has never been a problem for Israel because core Israel supporters will basically say, you know, Israel is living in a, in a tough neighborhood where people are always out there to get them. They make mistakes, but we love Israel. Well, that's, that, that's never been a problem. And conversely, you've got the others who are but, never uh, going to believe ab- Israel. Absolutely. Yeah. So and you're I looking think, for that slice in the middle. I think what happened yeah. during those Trump years is Israel ignored the middle. It was very focused on the home base, very focused on, I would say, countering the negative, the, the, the opposite side. Um, and now we are after Trump, and Israel is still searching. How do we communicate with the middle middle ground, with the people who have very little interest, who are not passionate about it, who may care because they're human beings and they're watching the news, but how do you communicate with that type of person that isn't invested in this conflict? I think that is the biggest challenge that Israel or Israeli communicators have or have always had. And we went through a period where they, would, they weren't important for communicating on, on, on behalf of Israel. And now the pendulum has, has flipped back and now Israel needs to communicate with a much broader audience, with a much appeal, more appealing uh, message of accountability for our mistakes, but also an intent to live in peace with our neighbors. And these are the types of things that Israel has been, for so many years, disconnected from. So, of course, it's a policy issue, but also communications, you, can, you shift who is your target audience. And I, 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 you know, when I was the spokesperson for the military, for the international media, my core audience was never the, the Israel supporters. It was always the people in the middle ground, people thinking that you know, they wanted to get more information. And at the end of the day, all I wanted was for them to say, oh, that Peter Lerner, he's an interesting guy. I'd like to sit down and have a beer with him. Because I think you know, we don't have a relatable message. We, have, we do live in a problematic neighborhood. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we have a lot of, a lot of, lot to offer the world. Uh, and so people are interested and people, you know, people want to know. And there, there will be people that, no matter what you say, they will be against you, but there are people that will say, hmm, that's and interesting. And the question is, is what, larger this, uh, what larger chunk that is. You used to feel that we're looking for the middle ground and you're always going to have your small thing. But now with the polarization in the world everywhere, You've got larger chunks of people who are just in your corner. There are larger people who are not there at all. And then you've got, I guess, a shrinking area of those who call what they call it like they see it, you know. And I guess Israel has good points to make here. They'll say, you know, we had, we had to go into Janine because the attackers came from Tel Aviv. And, uh, you know, how do you, you can make all the good points, but how, how many, I guess the question is, how can you convey this to people in a way that somebody actually might honestly say, oh, you know what, I get it, I understand the reasoning, or they're just mindset to begin with? So I would say the people that, people that are open-minded and have a, an, un, you know, an understanding that when a terrorist attack originates from Janine and is conducted against, uh, in Tel Aviv, then Israel has the right and, and obligation to its citizens to go and find those terrorists and, terrorists and root them out. Uh, I don't think we have a problem there. I think the problems usually develop on the ground when they are when they go beyond the reasonable counter-terrorist operations. You know, nobody in the West believes that we that the West doesn't have the right to counter-terrorism. They do it in in London. They do it in Paris. They do it in, 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 in everywhere. Um, so the problem is the broader picture of the question of occupation on one hand but also how we conduct ourselves at the times of the specific crisis. For instance, if it does fall, uh, or, or they do are able to find out that it was an Israeli bullet, for instance, that killed uh, Shirin Abu Akleh, will somebody be held accountable for that? And I think this sometimes is, is either not strong in, and not a message that is said strong enough about um, disciplinary steps that are taken against military forces or police forces when it, when it happens, or sometimes they're not taken at all because the circumstances of the operational, I would say the fog of conflict, say, okay, it's reasonable and it's possible. And yes, it's it's sad, but this is an ultimate a reality of conflict where people are caught up in, in the midst of a, of a battle fight, of a, of a gunfight. Mm-hmm. And that I think is, that is the challenge. People don't, you know, people are killed. You want to say, okay, who's to blame and what are, the, what are you doing about it? And sometimes in conflict, it's not as clear cut as that. Well, let's branch it out a little bit globally to try and put in a bit more perspective because there's a tendency here and elsewhere to sort of look at Israel sort of under a microscope. We're having a far larger conflict going on in the world right now, Russia and Ukraine, and that's sort of like the big thing that all the eyes are there. And that's an example of, you know, a, a case where it seems at least 
who are perception-wise, there's a very clear aggressor, there's a very clear victim. The Ukrainians have done a very good job in messaging that to the world. Uh, well, I guess we'll get to the second part of the question later, but the first part is, what can be learned from the way the Ukraine is handling the perception of theirs, and can that be implemented in any way in the Middle East? So, from the West perspective, Ukraine is obviously seen as the underdog. And that Israel doesn't want to be an underdog, and Israel wants to be strong in its in its area. It wants to project a, 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 a perception of power of strength. We live in the neighborhood that is very you know, uh, conflictual towards us, and Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas and all of these terrible negative players in the region. Ukraine is not in that in that situation. So I'd say. What we need to do, I would say, the, the things that we can learn from them are actually around the tactical issues of communicating, of being in the field, of leadership up front, um, uh, you know, utilizing social media uh, in a way where it's relatable and people can identify with it. I think you know, what we saw at the, at, the, at the outset of the conflict, we saw Zelensky doing these social you know, on, on Facebook and so on. You, know, you could reach out and touch him. Um, it actually looked a bit like how Netanyahu was managing his political campaign when he was running. Uh, so we know how to do it. It's it's realizing how how important is it. But but I would also say, and here's perhaps where all of Zelensky's co communications in um, on social media they're all focused for his internal audience, and the world around it liked that. We have to understand here the difference between the Israeli audience and communicating to an Israeli audience and communicating to the world because there are slightly different, I would say, nuanced messages, especially in our political atmosphere where you have political, you know, governments that, the, the government which is so eclectic and, and all over the place from, from, from an ideological perspective, they're just uh, in, in the room sitting together and they sometimes even can't get on. So how do you communicate to an Israeli audience a clear, coherent message of solidarity, of rallying around the flag? and how we're conducting yourself and what are we fighting for without getting yourself in trouble. So tactically, there are things to be learned from Ukraine, but mm. there's also a flip side to that, which is the danger for Israel. And that I've already seen it, even in this case, with Shimon Abu Akhla, that people are going to try to paint Israel as the Russia to the Palestinians, Ukraine. I even saw people saying, you know, oh, after when Israel was saying, oh, that they, they didn't know who shot it. It's like, now you're going to say, we don't know who killed the Ukrainians. So, I mean, is that just cynical, or is there really something there that people can say these situations put Israel in that corner where it just does not want to be? So I think we are living in, in I would say, uber cynical times. So everything is a question mark and you know an, uh, an eyebrow that is raised. I think that is basically what we see. How everything is perceived, definitely through mainstream media, because everybody's fighting for. Uh, rating and, 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 and clicks and people are trying to grab the audience by the guts. I think there's no real comparison, obviously, in this in this reality between Israel and Russia. And those detractors that are going to do that comparison are going to say are going to use every opportunity to say Israel is the bad guy in any case. And this is just the um, the next in, instance mm -hmm. in line. So just one last question, so we can wrap it up. Summarizing guessing all these things we talked about: what's in your control, what's out of control. What would you recommend? Because we know it's only a matter of time until something like this, not identical, will happen again. What's in Israel's control? What can it do to have a better outcome? Next time? So I would say from a communications pers perspective, we need to differentiate between the conflict with the Palestinians and the conflict with everybody else. Because those, one is works under the umbrella of the occupation, uh, where most of the world believes that that's, that is the situation. And you have international human rights organizations calling it apartheid and all different other I would say perspectives and, 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 and tags that are connected to Israel and the conflicts with our other enemies that are existent like uh, uh, Hezbollah and Iran and, and um, uh, in the broader scope I think there are two different types of conflicts that we have um, going on. With the Palestinian element we need uh, there needs to be a broader scope it can't just remain on the operators on the military or on the police who are implementing policy. There needs to be a broader policy that talks about engagement with our neighbors, building bridges, um, that, a, a message that can resonate with people living in the West, people that, that uh, realize that Israel, when 
says that its hand has reached out in peace to its neighbors actually does something. So that I would say there needs to be a, a smaller gap on the say, do uh, component when talking about the conflict. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Peter, enlightening on this very sensitive issue. That does it for here. We'll be back uh, now for our uh, Game Changer section in just a moment. All right, welcome back. It's time for our Game Changer section, which we look at the technology of the future. And today, I'm glad that we're joined by Alex Riachi, Head of Marketing and Business Development for the Tamam Division of IAI, and he's here to talk to us about electro-optics. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, electro-optics. I think I know what that means, but why don't you explain what it actually is? Yeah. So, we are talking about the scene of uh, warfare, and what is a very important thing is to see what's happened there, and how our eyes the God didn't give us all the capabilities. Actually, what you can see in the, all the light you can see with our eye is a very small part of the real information we have in the electro optics. If, for example, you can see rainbow, we have some colors between the violet and the red, but most information is before the violet, UV, and after the red, that is IR infrared. So the infrared, we are using the infrared in some cameras, some technologies, to add new information. For example, if you have a regular day camera, but you can see day and color camera, you are missing a lot of information. And in night, you cannot see anything. So the idea of the electro-optic system is to give you new technology, new cameras, and new detectors, and new optics, actually, so you are able with that to see also in the full darkness, you can see the heat and not only an image. So you don't need a, a, sun, a light, you don't need anything, and you can exactly see what's happened in any condition. So you can imagine for any kind of warfare, it's very important to have all the capabilities. And you are putting all of these cameras into the EOIR system that you are producing. Now, I was going to say, I'm sure that when it comes to warfare, these are huge tools to have. So what are the current limitations that exist today in the systems? What are, what are you trying to overcome? The new, so the limitation we have now, if you want to see far, simply you need to put a bigger optics. A bigger optics, same uh, weight, since price, since very difficult size. So if you want to put, let's say, long, long distance optics on a, on a small platform, you can do that. Because you have another budget to do that, because it uh, will be 100 kilos uh, instead of five kilos, and the price will be very high. And you cannot put $2 million system on a small platform. So some of who, if you need to, to see far, now we have no solution. The other problem we have with that, is that if you want, like your cell phone, if you want to see far, your field of view will be smaller. So you can see 30 kilometers, that's very nice, but only 0.5 degrees. And what happened out of 0.5 degrees, it's very, very narrow, like a straw. You have no idea about what will happen, and we need to know all the sensors and all the technology addition to the AOIR. So it's very limited. So to overcome this, there's new kinds of technology, something I'm told is called wide angle motion imagery, or whammy for short. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? What does it offer? We think that the whammy actually is the future of the AOIR technology. How we are doing that? We're using new technology, new sensor, new optics, and new different things, not to see only half a degree, but to see, for example, 60 degree or 90 degree for different platforms. After you have a very wide angle and a lot of pixels, because the new technology of the pixel is there, I can use all the pixels to automatically add a lot of algorithms like AI, artificial intelligence. And if you, are, you can see the wall scene, you will be able to see, okay, now our, my computer is looking for a white uh, car, for example. I know that some terrorists can be in a white car. And automatically the system will take the, the 90 degrees and automatically find for you the white car and track after that and give you the coordinate in right time for, for your car. So instead of our very small straw and not to know what will happen outside, you will have all the, the image all the scene in one in one uh, in one system and automatically to find the threats and to track after that and give to this a full uh, intelligence image in only one system that is on the of of course in day night conditions and um, we think that definitely that is the future of the h optics very difficult we are developing new system both for airborne both for anti-drones for example if you are looking for drones and for a main metal tank for example and one of the full, very good advantage to this technology is that it's fully passive. That means that no one can see you right. and, and know that you are there. Excellent. Fascinating stuff. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for joining us for that. 
And that does it for us here for episode four of Defense Matters. A reminder again to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Hope you're enjoying this podcast and this journey as much as we are. Until next time, I'm Aaron Heller saying thank you for joining us, and I'll see you next time on Defense Matters. Thank you.